Hey everyone, thanks for coming by. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and you're listening to episode 327. Today, we're going to talk about Jeet Kune Do. My name's Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for this show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick Martial Arts, and I love traditional martial arts. I've been doing it all my life, and now it's my job. It's my job to help you love the martial arts even more, and I'll do whatever I can to make that happen. If you want to check out our products, our projects, our services, all the stuff we've got going on, you can find that at whistlekick.com, and you can find the show notes for this and all of our other episodes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Most of them have a transcript. We're actually going back and transcribing all the old episodes. So if you're in a spot where you can't listen, but you could read, you might want to check those out. Or, of course, for our friends who are hearing impaired. We want to make sure that we give as much as we can to all martial artists, regardless of how they take in their entertainment. Let's talk about Jeet Kune Do. We've spent a lot of time talking about Bruce Lee on this show, especially lately. Episode 305 with Mr. Matthew Polly talking about his book, Bruce Lee, A Life, received a ton of attention, and we thought it might be a good idea to dig deeper into part of the legacy that Bruce Lee left, namely the martial arts style that isn't a style, in a sense, Jeet Kune Do. Jeet Kune Do, or JKD, is a martial arts style founded and developed by the martial artist Bruce Lee on July 9th, 1967. It is based on the personal and martial arts philosophies of Lee. What makes it unique is that it doesn't have any fixed patterns or katas, unlike most traditional martial arts. Similar to Wing Chun, Jeet Kune Do prioritizes the concept of attacking while one's opponent is about to attack, applying the principle of minimal movement with maximum effect. The Bruce Lee Foundation changed the name of the martial art to Jun Fan Jeet Kune Do on January 10, 1996, after the Chinese given name for Bruce Lee, Jun Fan. Lee believed that katas or movement patterns restrict one's liberty in expressing oneself in executing movements. And he thought that martial arts styles had become unrealistic. He even described the katas as, quote, organized despair because the martial artist should be able to freely express without any limitations. Because of this philosophy, Jeet Kune Do included all possible forms of strikes, even the ones that are illegal in tournament matches such as eye gouging and groin strikes. According to Lee, the name Jeet Kune Do was just a label and referred to it mostly as, quote, the art of expressing the human body. He called martial art competitions dry land swimming, which I think is a wonderful visual, and he believed in the concept of real-life combat, where the martial artist cannot predict the next attack from the opponent, but only react accordingly. He said that a good martial artist must be like water, continuously flowing without any restriction. Lee researched many fighting styles, and he first called it Jun Fan, Gung Fu, after his name. He did not want to create another style as it would sound limited, as he felt all other styles were. Jeet Kune Do is the result of Lee's lifetime of training in different martial arts. Lee's concept was not about just adding more things on top of each other to form a system, but by taking what's best and incorporating it into one system. He compared his philosophy to Chan Buddhism's metaphor for removing what is useless by constantly filling a cup with water and then emptying it. He also used the notion of a sculptor starting with a lump of clay and then gradually removing the unnecessary material through the process of sculpting. These principles resulted in what is called bare combat essentials or Jeet Kune Do. A martial artist should primarily use his or her dominant or strongest hand because it would perform better and will work more to the person's advantage. Lee believed that despite the overall formidability of the on-guard stance, fighting stance, many styles call it, there are other stances that are more useful in some, maybe even many, situations. He felt that the characteristics of Jeet Kune Do as being dynamic enabled its practitioners to become familiar with the ever-changing and unpredictable events of actual combat. He believed that a martial artist can only truly develop techniques or adopt the ones from other styles in a, quote, real combat and or all-out sparring environment as the person would be obligated to make a critical decision and use the most advantageous techniques. Since everything is dynamic in actual combat, predefined patterns and techniques would seem 
ineffective. Lee laid down the principles of Jeet Kune Do, and he deemed that these principles can be applied to any form of combat. A martial artist should have the full understanding of the four ranges of combat, because this is essential in survival. If the fight can be ended from a distance, say with a kick, then that would be the ideal situation, the ideal fighting range. If not, then a closer range would come next, like punching. Jeet Kune Do teaches that an incoming attack should be intercepted, not just blocked, following the principle that the best defense is a strong offense. Furthermore, not only physical attacks, but also nonverbal cues from the opponent can be observed and used to one's advantage. Aside from the four ranges of combat, there are the five ways of attack that teach the offensive techniques that help the Jeet Kune Do practitioner in organizing their fighting method. Lee didn't approve of fancy stances. He believed that fighting in this way would bind the person to unnatural rhythmic movements, and in actual combat, the rhythm gets broken. The opponent will not do the same rhythm that they might do in practice. The movement should be constant, small, shifting steps. This type of stance and movement can be seen in many of Bruce Lee's movies. For example, The Way of the Dragon, where he fought Chuck Norris. He used that, that side, southpaw stance, followed by right-hand jabs and a lot of sidekicks. When blocking a kick, he doesn't use the leg check that we might see in some martial arts, but rather an oblique kick. We also use the defensive techniques from other systems, like Western boxing, such as slipping and rolling, and gung fu, like forearm blocks. According to Lee, exercising using a jump rope will greatly improve one's agility and footwork. And proper footwork can assure victory as the distance from the opponent is properly maintained. As seen in Lee's movies, he used quick, skipping-like footwork that was inspired in part by Muhammad Ali's strong footwork. The straight lead punch, or jab, is the fastest punch in Jeet Kune Do and, arguably, any martial art. Lee considered it to be the backbone of all punches in JKD due to its reliability. The straight lead punch lacks power compared to other techniques, but due to the speed, it can be devastating because there can be a greater frequency of successful hits. It is also the most accurate punch because it travels the shortest path to the opponent. The punch can be thrown from different positions and levels, but normally it's thrown from the center of the body and not from the waist or shoulder. One of the core philosophies of Jeet Kune Do is to perform an attack without the opponent noticing. The goal is to catch the opponent off guard and destroy his or her balance while decreasing his or her chances to defend, to make the following attacks more effective. As Lee wrote, quote, The concept behind this is that when you initiate your punch without any forewarning, such as tensing your shoulders or moving your foot or body, the opponent will not have enough time to react. Meaning, one must only be tense upon impact and have the arms and body loose while still planning for the next moves. In JKD, there are also no get-ready poses because this would defeat the philosophy that Lee incorporated to JKD. There should be no signs or hints that an attack will be delivered as the opponent could strike first. Now, how many times have you seen, heard, read this quote? Empty your mind, be formless, shapeless, like water. If you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, and it becomes the bottle. You put in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now, water can flow or it can crash. Be water, my friend. This is what Lee wanted for all JKD practitioners to achieve. As every activity or event in a man's life is varied, the same thing happens in fighting. It is important for a fighter not to be rigid, but be flexible to adapt to any situation. Flexibility allows a person to learn new things aside from the already known techniques, and this could lead to one's victory either in life or in combat. This means that one can react accordingly and instantaneously to any form of attack. Moreover, one should not stick to styles. The goal is to improve oneself through learning new methods and to apply them appropriately. Jeet Kune Do teaches not to waste any motion in executing a movement. For example, a pak sao, a blocking technique from Wing Chun, must be executed quickly to not give an opening to the opponent. It is necessary to minimize any unnecessary motion, and it requires a lot of practice to achieve mastery. The economy of motion comes from three facts or principles in Jeet Kune Do. 1. Non-classical. No unnecessary movements and postures, especially those that are inherited from, quote, styles. 2. Directness. Every defense should incorporate a counterattack, 
Simply blocking is the least efficient. And three, simplicity. Minimize the movement to make it simpler and more straightforward. A punch is just like a punch, a kick just like a kick. Remove all the sophistication and ornamentation. Both energy and time must be conserved. More damaging blows will consume more energy, but may take the opponent out sooner, thus conserving time. Less damaging blows will mean faster strikes that can cause the opponent less time to react. One of the principles of Jeet Kune Do is to take advantage of any possible opening that an opponent may give. And one example is when the opponent prepares for an attack. An oncoming attack must not only be blocked, but must be intercepted. A JKD practitioner should not only receive damage, but try to damage the opponent. This is one of the most difficult skills to develop because there are many variations of attack. However, when performed successfully, this strategy can minimize the fighting time as the attack and defense are combined into just one movement. In a similar way, an attack is parried or redirected, deflected, while a counterattack is delivered simultaneously. When an attack is parried, it may cause an imbalance to the opponent, thus causing him or her to have less time to react or plan for another attack. Moreover, parrying, as opposed to blocking, does not consume as much energy, making the fighter more efficient in combat. The best body parts to deliver a kick to are the shins, knees, thighs, and midsection, as also taught in Wing Chun. Low kicks are more stable than high kicks, and they require less time to execute. However, if better opportunity is seen in a fight where the potential target is above the waist, it should be seized immediately and should override this overall principle of low kicking. Earlier, I mentioned the four ranges of combat, and if you aren't familiar with those, and this shows up in quite a few martial arts, kicking, punching, trapping, and grappling. We can see that the distance gets closer as we get deeper into the list. A JKD practitioner should identify which range is best when fighting an opponent. Kicking an opponent will keep the farthest distance, but if it constantly fails, then another range could be tried. It's also important to know the forte, the preference of your opponent. For example, one should stay away from the punching range of a person who's good in boxing. While it's a good strategy to know the opponent's skills, it's unrealistic when you're fighting a stranger. Therefore, one must keep distance as much as possible and use the farthest range of attack. If the situation requires to move to a shorter range, one must be ready to execute the corresponding attacks suitable for that range. The last option should always be grappling or going to the ground, especially if the opponent is difficult to subdue. Blocking and avoiding attacks are more difficult when fighting on the ground. The center line theory is a theory that Lee adapted from Wing Chun. Imagine a vertical line traveling through the center of the body, and one must defend that center line, always, because this is where the vital organs are located. On the other hand, the center line of the opponent should be dominated and controlled to gain the greatest fighting advantage. Punching from the center line can also give more power to the punch from proper hip and body movement. All forms of attack and defenses, as well as footwork and JKD, evolve around the centerline theory. There are three guidelines to centerline theory. Controlling the centerline will also control how the fight goes. The centerline must be guarded at all times while attempting to dominate the opponents. And the centerline can only be controlled by occupying it. Conditioning. Li used arm conditioning, such as Da Sam Sing, or three stars conditioning, a common drill in Chinese martial arts. As Li trained under Ip Man, a master teacher of Wing Chun, he also trained with a wooden dummy, Mokyan Zhong, but modified it by adding a neck and a metal leg. Li strongly believed that martial arts should be designed to be used in actual combat, not only in tournaments and rule-bound matches, meaning the techniques developed in martial arts should be effective and practical in actual combat, which is the reason why he was compelled to develop the Jeet Kune Do system. Combat realism is the main difference between JKD and other martial arts styles, or so he felt, where the techniques in other styles involve, quote, flowery techniques that would not save someone in street survival. While forms may help, Lee eliminated the unnecessary motion in the intention of quickly defeating the opponent. Because of this, Lee was in favor of using sparring gear to be able to spar all out in training sessions. As a result, the sparring in JKD is close to actual combat 
where the participants do their best to survive and defeat their opponent. Now I'm going to drop the disclaimer that I probably should have at the top of the episode, but here it is, just to make sure it is part of the episode. I'm not an expert in Jeet Kune Do. I've never trained in Jeet Kune Do, and this episode is based entirely on our research here at Whistlekick and an attempt to distill a lot of information down to 15 minutes or so of speech. I am not saying that this is the be-all, end-all. I am not saying that this is the perfect representation of Jeet Kune Do. And more importantly, Jeet Kune Do is more of a concept, more of a system of concepts. It is different now, from my understanding, from speaking with high-level practitioners, than it was when it was founded. Why am I offering this disclaimer? Because it seems that anything that we put out that has Bruce Lee's name on it catches a lot of attention and flack. So I'm hoping that those of you who listen to this or read this on the website will understand that our attempt here is simply to give you some fundamentals that may inspire you or interest you in going deeper into what Jeet Kune Do is. That's it. That's all we're doing. Okay. If you want to find the show notes, the transcript, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. The products, the services, the other projects that we do, like Martial Journal, things like that, whistlekick.com. You can find a lot of our products on Amazon or maybe even in your martial arts school. We do have a wholesale program and quite a few wholesale customers. If you want to find us on social media, we are at Whistlekick. Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram are our primary outlets, but we're also on YouTube, and we pop around in other places from time to time. If you want to reach me directly, the best way is email, jeremy at whistlekick.com. We drop episodes twice a week, and hopefully you enjoy at least some of them. That's all I've got for you today. I'm going to head off. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.